Hello and welcome to the Change the News for Good Summit, where we have been talking about how you can create a movement that goes viral, produce compelling content, and reach millions. I am your host, Yata Jones. I am on Jackie Cote's team. And with us today is Dr. Laura Sicola. We are so happy to have her. Laura, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Yada. <laughs> so, Laura, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us your background and what it is that you do. Sure. My focus is on leadership communication and executive presence. So many people know that they have the expertise, they've got the experience, they've got the background, they belong at the top, or they are already at the top, but there's that challenge of getting out that knowledge and getting it across to people in a way that they just get it, right? That makes them see you as that consummate leader. Because really, when you think about it, leadership is not a role, it's not a title, nobody has it on their business card, it's an image, right? And if people are only doing what you tell them to do because they have to, because that means you're the boss, not that you're a leader, but they'll do it voluntarily, willingly, passionately even, if they truly see you as a leader worth following. And that's my goal. Awesome. I love that. So share with us, what's one strategy, right, that anyone can use to overcome um, nerves or fears around speaking in public? <laughs> That is such a commonly experienced problem for so many people, isn't it? That uh, I think there's an expression that four out of five people would rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy at a given funeral. So it's such a hard thing for many people to overcome. But to me, uh, there, I tell all of my clients who are working on any sort of public speaking preparation, it's a four word mantra that you need to just keep reminding yourself over and over it's not about you because we get so in our heads well what if i make this mistake what if i make that mistake what if they think this about me what if they think that about me it's the fear of public judgment not public speaking but in reality think about when you're in the audience are you sitting there like the stereotypical high school english teacher with a red pen poised waiting to ding them on every little thing of course not you're sitting there going please be good i really want you to be good because i want my experience in the audience to be good so really the audience is cheering you on you have the benefit of the doubt just roll with it they want to hear what you have to say that's why they're there awesome i love that distinction that it's really you know uh more of a fear of judgment Yes. And not speaking. It is, um, it is. So, so speak into like, what is one way, I'm sure there's multiple, but like what's maybe the major way that we get in our own way and, you know, we limit like our own reach and ability to influence others. We tend to forget, I think more than anything else, we tend to forget who our audience is and where they're coming from. Because often, especially in work situations, we talk again from our own expertise. And if you're somebody who's in IT, you need to be able to talk to people who are in finance and in marketing and in sales. And same thing, all of those different departments need to be able to talk to each other, understanding the customer's perspective, not just the producers or so many different uh, people come to a conversation with different needs different amounts of background knowledge, different interests. And it's not just about telling people what you think they need to know. It's about making sure that they get what they want to know, what they really think that they need to know. And if you can bridge that gap, then you can get them to start to listen to the other things that are more critical to you. But we gotta make sure that we're meeting their needs first and their perceived needs is part of that. Yeah, I love that you talk about really just finding and meeting their need because that's Jackie's whole, uh, like her whole mission and, you know, where she comes from is, is a place of finding what the people's needs are and showing up um, from a place of service yes. to doing media. You know, this entire summit is really about changing media, like just changing the narrative in the media from yeah is just negative and dark to, to one that really uh, showcases and highlights all the good that's being done in the world. And so, you know, just hearing you talk about that, you know, it's, it's a testament to like all of 
um, what people really want to be hearing about and what they need to be hearing about, uh, which is, <laughs> you know, we hear all the time, like, what's the number one fear? Public speaking. Yeah. <laughs> so there's such a huge need um, in the media to talk about that. Uh, talk about like, you know, um, how do you see yourself contributing to like inspiring good and creating good in the world that ultimately gets to be um, how we change the news for good? Uh, to me, I think really making sure that people are able to take that message that they're so passionate about from their head and get it across to others. This is where I think messaging, storytelling, all of these different communication modes are, are they're almost cut off too soon because people haven't formed their thoughts sufficiently. They haven't really thought about the angle of what, you know, what's going to be most meaningful to their audience, the word choice, their delivery style. They can have the most amazing story, but you know, they get on and especially if there's a camera, it's like there's that little black dot staring at them and then they just go totally monotone. And it's like, no, you love this. Come on, let me see you in your story. So helping people to tell their stories, helping them to find the courage to tell their stories, helping them find the way to massage the message, to, to organize it so that people can follow them. You know, I like to say that one of the biggest mistakes people make is thinking that they want a captive audience. I don't want a captive audience. Captives are people who are stuck there, tied to their chairs, not allowed to leave. They're being held captive and against their will. I want a captivated audience when I speak. And that's my goal is to help people to, to, to work their messaging and speak in a way that completely captivates the audience. Uh, and I think one way that I've been able to do that is not just with my, my formal coaching clients and training clients, but um, one of my favorite things to do that's some pro bono service that I do is uh, doing TED coaching for the TED fellows and for uh, TED related organizations. Um, there's a TEDx that's being, cre uh, that's being put together now and it's, it's the second one of this kind that I will have been working with in a, a prison in Uganda. And they're organizing it so that it is looking at changing the whole penal system in much of Africa and really around the world, but to make it a place of growth, make it a place of education and a place of opportunity. So they'll be having prison guards and inmates and former inmates and all sorts of people learning to give a TED talk and to share their story. And, and I'm so excited to be part of that. That is exciting. Wow, I, I absolutely love that. And this is exactly what excites me most about um, Jackie putting together this summit is right now we get in video format, we get to see and hear all of the good that is happening uh, throughout the world. And it just, uh, it may sound uh, somewhat, you know, like in the stars or, you know, in the clouds, but I mean, it really does restore hope in humanity to know that there's so much being done and i i'm a firm believer that there's more good <laughs> i do too i do too yes yeah. and I, i'm really so honored to be part of this because of that it, it's such an important message for us to share collectively and not just one here and one there so i'm thrilled to be part of this team awesome so you know i've been asking everyone their thoughts around uh what they think creates something that goes viral or like, uh, you know, what, what do you think it takes to create a movement, you know, to get something that just builds, like one of the, the, the movements um, that has built um, just quite rapidly uh, and recently is the Me Too movement. I don't know if you've been- mm, Yes, yes, of course. In that movement. Yes. Like, yeah, you know, so, so many people out there have shared their stories courageously and we're seeing what's happening um, uh, in the media right now, which is so many courageous people coming forward, sharing their stories and holding people accountable. Um, so that way our workspaces and, you know, our homes and everywhere um, is, is a safer place for everyone. Mm -hmm. So what do you say or what do you think it, it takes um, to really create something that goes viral, to create a movement that just builds and, and it just, you know, has an, uh, an impact and it changes the world for better. I think more than anything else, uh, Yata, you have to make sure that your message is personal and it's 
personal from you, where it's coming from. People have to see it being part of who you are and that you truly are, uh, you're passionate about what you're sharing. But then it also has to be personal for them. It's not usually enough for them to just say, oh, that's interesting. Or, oh, yes, I see how that's important. When they feel it personally, when there's an impact or some sort of uh, connection that they feel, then that's usually when you're going to get people beyond the thinking, beyond the feeling, and into the action. And that's the hard part. People love to think about stuff. But to get them off the couch and do something different, that's, that's where the challenge is. Um, for me personally, it's funny. Of all little things, I think of the one, um, the one item that I get asked to teach more than anything else in, in any of my programs is about how to say your name differently in a way that makes it stick in other people's minds. Because when you think about it, we're all really bad at remembering names. And most, uh, much of the reason is because the way other people say their names, it, they pronounce their own names wrong. And by wrong, I mean they sort of run past it too fast. They ask it like it's a question, like, hi, I'm Laura Sicola, I think. And they blur it all together like one big slur of sound. And it just goes in one ear and out the other. But when, and I, I mentioned this in my TEDx talk also, and that, that's the one thing that I have that has really gone viral with about, uh, almost 5 million views, which is kind of exciting. But the, so what you want to do is to start with your, your first name going up and then a pause at the top to separate the names and then the last name coming down. And it's like putting a period at the end and slowing it down by about 25% slower than you normally would say it because people need a chance to process what they've heard. So when I say my name, I'd say I'm Laura Sicola. Laura Sicola instead of Laura Scola, like, right? So uh, when, that's the one thing. People will hear me talk about it or they'll see one of my videos with it. And if they ask me to come and speak to their groups, they're like, oh, you're going to do the name thing, right? Can you do the name thing with everybody? I want them. And I, it's because, to bring this back to your original question, that it's the, their name is their most personal piece of identity, right? How often do you say your own name introducing yourself to people? You doing these interviews must say your own name a hundred times in the course of a day, plus emails and phone calls and whatever else. So that's where the connection starts. That, that's the glue for me. So I would Yata Jones. Beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> yes. And people will catch that because I bet on the phone when you say, hi, I'm Yata Jones, or, or when you say, I'm Yata Jones, and you say it quick, people go, can you say it again? I, they make it the Jones part, but the, what was the, for, do you have to repeat yourself frequently? Um, or sometimes? You know what, I, I find that, and I'm glad you brought, brought it up, like to, you know, really uh, support people in saying your name correctly. I will tell people, yeah. name is, well, not so much saying it correctly, but to remember it. Yeah. I'll say my name is Yata Jones. Mm -hmm. And it's like yada, 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 you know, when someone talks. Right, right. So they'll remember, they may remember yada, and that's right. sometimes what I'll get, it's yada. <laughs> Which is the American yeah. way. Yeah, right. yeah. And when I was younger, my mom told me, she was like, how I used to correct everyone, I would say, my name with a neck <laughs> My name is Yata, my maiden name Blanton. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but as I've gotten older, and I, and and I would love for you to speak into this, like you know, sure, what, you know, like what what's the because everything is like you know driven by some belief. So it's like, um, you know, what, for me, what happened is I just stopped uh, uh, being as adamant about it, like mm -hmm. every single interaction. Mm -hmm. I would pick and choose my battles. So do you find that like with your clients, like where they've just kind of tapered off in like holding that excellence for themselves? Um, sorry, say that again about the taper part. I, I missed the connection Yeah, so there. for me, I'll say um, to some people, if they say yada, which is incorrect, mm -hmm. sure. but I do get that. Sure. I'll say yata, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll right. clarify for them. And then there's other times when uh, I'll just let it, let it go. So I wanted you to just speak into that. Is there how to make those choices do we do it every single time? Do we pick our battle? Oh, yeah, of course you pick your battle. Uh, and that's, that's, I think goes without saying nowadays, you can't fight everyone. But at the same time, the question is, does it have to be a battle? And I think mm -hmm. that's really the question because most people, 
you know, when, how old were you in those examples when you, you know, you had the whole neck roll thing going Like, on? I was, uh, like, from young, like, high school, um, I would say in between, like, five and high school. Okay. So, <laughs> in your childhood and your adolescence, yeah, which is when yeah. attitude tends to develop for better or for worse in kids. And, but that's the thing, right? When you, when you think about how you were responding as a child, there was an attitude that was reflecting an annoyance that was chastising people for getting it wrong, for assuming that they're not paying attention or, or something along those lines. And what's important in, and I do a lot of work in, in uh, conflict management as well with people, is to try to figure out what their true intention was. Were they really trying to disrespect you by deliberately mispronouncing your name? Probably not. And at that point, if you're going to scold them for it or reprimand them somehow for the mistake, then it's going to put them on the defensive and then you're angry and they're backtracking or they fight fire with fire and you know, everything explodes as opposed to saying, actually, it's yata. I, I know it's weird or I know it's uncommon or, but you pronounce the T's. So and then you can come up with a different mnemonic of some sort like for a yata, but with a T in the middle, yata, whatever you like. Uh, but it's, I think what's critical to having that conversation flow with the relationship develop and create something that is for good instead of that downward spiral is to make sure that we share generously and that we correct people when necessary with a heart of generosity and not with a heart of, of reprimanding or of putting people down. That's where collaboration starts. Awesome. What makes someone credible? Credibility is, is a challenge for a lot of people. And in many ways, it's because they tend to undermine themselves in the process by the way that they're delivering their message. And when you think about credibility, it is actually a constellation of factors. It's not just a single factor. And when you speak, what's critical is that there are three channels of communication that you're using all at the same time. And the real question is, are they aligned with each other or not? And those three channels are the verbal channel, the vocal channel, and the visual channel. And the verbal channel is your words. Imagine the text or the transcript of what you said. The, and so, of course, those things need to be appropriate. They need to be accurate. They need to have the right amount of technical words or simple language used. Uh, keeping away from extra fillers like um and I mean like you know all of those kinds of things uh, it needs to be well organized stories versus just dry explanations etc the second channel is your vocal channel and that's the sound of your voice as the words are coming out that's what makes people hear how you actually feel about what you're saying because I can tell you that uh, my name is Laura Sokola and I have a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and I taught at uh, grad school for 10 years and I own a consulting company and I work with the Department of Commerce and other big, and everything I said is right, but do you care? Do you believe me? It's, it's just like totally, I hear the words, but I'm not listening to the words. I'm listening to the sound of them and that's what I'm buying into. And the third channel, is the visual. So you have your three Vs, right? The verbal, vocal, and visual, if you imagine a triangle. The visual triangle, or excuse me, the visual channel is your physical communication, your body language. So if I'm sitting here and I'm picking at my fingers the entire time that I'm talking to you, or I keep touching my face, or I am um, looking over in somewhere else instead of looking at you when I'm talking to you the entire time, that all of that says something, right? Your posture, your hand gestures. I mean, I tend to gesture as, as a matter of animation when I speak, but I'm not doing this and I'm not in at your, <laughs> you don't want to be distracting to them. You, if you have gestures, they should be deliberate and meaningful, but not overwhelming. So really having that balance in those three, but when you've got those three channels, the verbal, vocal, and visual all aligned with each other, that's when the audience can focus completely and totally on the central message, and that makes you sound more credible. So it's when one of those is out of alignment, that's what, they're get, that's what distracts them. That's what they focus on. They ignore the message. They ignore you. They're just looking at your body language. You're listening to your voice and going, mm, not buying it. So they have to buy into you before they'll buy into your product, service, or idea. Yeah, that's absolutely. And that's so much of 
what Jackie coaches her clients around, just really being able to do media in a way that is authentic, but also they're proud of it when they look back on it or they listen to it or read it. Yes. They can see how they showed up in a very professional way, you know, that established them as the expert in the field that they are. And so I'm really glad that, you know, you touched on that because we do tend to speak with our hands or be created sure. and it can, uh, as you said, it can be overwhelming and then your message gets lost. And, you know, it's, um, it's not clear and it's not resonating. So right. definitely a, a great, great reminder. Um, what have been some innovative ways that you have used uh, content and or media to reach millions? You talked a little bit just now um, or prior about your uh, TED Talks and maybe mm -hmm. uh, speak into that as well. Sure. Uh, if you can do a TEDx talk of any sort, I highly recommend it. It's a great experience, teaches you all sorts of things, but it is um, it certainly takes a lot of preparation. So make sure you give yourself enough buffer for that. But a really good TED talk can be the best marketing tool you could possibly ask for. And it, it certainly has been for me. I never intended it to be that way. That's kind of the beauty of the viral movement. A lot of it is not intentional. Um, but I, I it was three years ago and I had I gave my talk with the intention of making sure that people had a new way of looking at the way that they were communicating and at the way that they were um, where they had control over their leadership projection and how they wanted people to see them. And this is something where you can adjust your delivery depending on who your audience is, because they may need to see different parts of your personality come out in order to connect with you. And for me, the TED Talk was an opportunity to share how to do that and to share why it matters um, on both a social and communication level, as well as on a cognitive level. And I think when people see that, they go, oh, you know, I never thought about it. And then there's the piece in the middle about saying your name differently. And that was what made a lot of people share it because it was like, hey, this is personal for me. I bet it'll be personal for you because you probably have a name too, right? So including that, that piece in it helped to make it explode. And uh, I'm not the best marketer on the planet. I, I wish I was better at social media. That's um, an art form that I'm still learning. But this is something where with minimal amount of marketing, it has really exploded. So. Um, like I said, it's been just over three years now, and it's uh, 4.6, 4.7 million uh, views already, which I'm certainly proud of. Uh, and I'm gonna, I, I can only take credit for the talk, not for the for the publicity. So it's it's a great movement when it has when it finally gets legs. What was the talk? What was the title of it? The talk was called "Want to Sound Like a Leader? Start by Saying Your Name Right." So that. the name piece is just in the middle. It's one example, but it's all about the buildup. We do talk about the three V's. We talk about executive presence um, and what creates executive presence and how different elements of your speaking style are going to either reinforce or undermine that image that you're trying to project. And for me as a coach, my, in, in, in my trainings and coaching, my goal is usually to help people close the gap between on the one hand, how they want to come across and how they think they come across compared to how they actually come across. Because most people are really, really blind to that third piece. So my goal is to show you that divide and then help you to close it. Absolutely. And so I know you have a awesome resource to share with the audience today. Um, why don't you go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about it? Sure. I have a very easy, very quick um, one-page, 10-point checklist on how to speak like a leader. So if you want to get up there and command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal, which are my big three Cs, then this is the checklist that's going to help you before you go into any conversation, any meeting, any presentation, any phone call just to look at it and say, okay, note to self, remember to do this, don't do that, right. You just put yourself in check and you go in there and nail it. So a 10 point checklist, do you speak like a leader? Awesome. And you know, before we go, cause we are, we're wrapping up, I know- Oh, I gotta tell you where to get it. Yeah, oh sure, go ahead, go ahead. 
if you want that 10 point checklist, you go visit my website at www.vocalimpactproductions.com slash free gift. And that's what it will also have the link available with the video. So they'll be able to access it. But okay. before you go, I just wanted you to, to share what's that one thing right before someone gets ready to speak that they can do to just like calm their nerves? Um, well, in addition to what I mentioned in the beginning, as far as reminding yourself those, that four word mantra, right? It's mm -hmm. not about you. The, the other thing people need to remember to do is breathe. And it may sound cliche, it's not. When you, if you actually were to take your pulse for 10 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever it is, when you feel that adrenaline kicking in, the, and then if you do what's called square breathing, where you'll inhale slowly through the nose for as long as it takes, four or five counts, then hold it for the same amount of time, and then exhale through the mouth slowly for that same count or longer, and then hold that emptiness for the same count of four or five. And then repeat that. And if you can do that five or 10 times and take your pulse again, you'll realize that it has actually dropped dramatically. There is a major uh, measurable physical difference that you can see. And so don't let your brain scramble itself because the adrenaline is going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Remember also that the same way you believe that you can talk yourself out of something, right? You can psych yourself out. Oh yeah. <laughs> so in the same way, you can psych yourself in. So when, that, when your adrenaline starts, that heart starts racing, your body does not inherently know the difference between nervous and excited. It just is energy. So instead of going down the rabbit hole and reminding yourself over and over, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous, and then it, you, know, you disappear at that point, it, this, all hope is lost. You want to go in the other direction and say, okay, I'm so excited, I'm so excited, this is a great opportunity, I want to do this. This is the outcome I want. This is the impact I want to make. So get yourself psyched in. You care, you're nervous because you care, because you're excited. Focus on that positive instead and pull yourself up so that you can excel there. Ride the energy wave. Don't fight it. Don't, don't run away from it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for being here with us and sharing this free gift with our audience. Um, we know that any and everyone watching will be able to benefit from this. So on behalf of Jackie and her entire team, we just want to thank you for being here with us and just sharing all of your knowledge and expertise. Yata, thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun and I would love to continue the conversation. Awesome. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.